Thank you so much, Charles. Such a pleasure having you on the podcast, X Monk Strike. Oh, thank you, Grohav. I'm looking really forward to talking with you today. Thank you. And Charles, I remember our first conversation. Probably that was the year 2014. And I was a part of one of the projects that you were leading. And I remember you were sharing the feedback with another fellow coach. And I was literally smitten by your ability to pick up clues, the finer nuances of coaching. And since then, I've admired you. So thank you so much. And when you accepted my invitation to be on this podcast, I felt so obliged. So I'm humbled. Well, I appreciate the invitation, believe me. Um, I'm looking forward very much to talking with you today. And um, yeah, uh, coaching is, it's all, uh, it's all about those, that, that ability to listen deeply into another person. And I think you have that as well. So um, yes, I'm, I'm glad to be here today. Honored. So let's take a deeper dive in knowing who Charles is for the benefit of people who might not be aware of or who might not be knowing Charles. So why don't you share a episode from your childhood that brings a smile on your face today as well? Sure, I can do that. So I, I love water. I love, I've loved being in the water and around the mm. water pretty much all my life ever since. I mean, I think um, my parents said that I knew how to swim before I could even walk. I'm kind of skeptical of that, but um, that seemed to be one of the family stories. But I think one of the things I remember, I must have been about 12 or 13. And I had been spent much of the summer of that year trying to learn this. Well, not trying, but learning to surf because I really wanted to do that. And um, I had spent really pretty much all of my days getting up on my surfboard and falling off, getting up on my surfboard and falling off. And um, finally, one day, I not only got up and stayed up, but I realized, I realized I could do it. And I realized what it felt like to be able to do it in my body, um, hmm. to be able to balance and, um, and uh, go with the wave and shift my position and shift my weight and move with the board and with the wave. And it was just an incredible feeling. Mm. And uh, yeah, that, that certainly, that was a, a great high point um, around that age in my life. Mm. This is really interesting since we are talking about listening and you are talking about surfing. A few days back, I was reading an article where somebody mentioned about a metaphor that resonates with this person when it comes to coaching. And he said, he was talking to a surfer and he said, hey, how do you manage to surf on these waves? They go up and come down. How do you manage that? And the, the surfer said, I listen to the waves. Every time when they rise, I bend my knees. Every time when they fall, I stretch my legs. And that's how he listens to the waves while he's on water. Yeah, yes. Uh, there's, there's an ability to listen with our bodies that is... I think crucial to coaching for one thing, but mm. just life in general, to be able to listen to the world around us, to be, you know, I, I believe we are constituted in the conversation between ourselves and what surrounds us and being able to really listen to what it is that's there around us mm. and from a place of presence allows us to be in deeper conversation and therefore more that arises out of that conversation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, listening is really, and listening with all of ourselves, listening with our ears, of course, that's the simple uh, way of listening, but also listening with our, with our hearts, with our bodies, with our eyes. Yeah. Listening is important and valuable for sure. And you said something so beautiful. You said listening with our presence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is definitely a moment to pause, to reflect on what it means to listen from your presence. Listen with your body, listen with your heart, listen with your senses, listen with your eyes. Hmm. 
Now, Charles, you've been in the space of leadership development for so many decades. In fact, you have written a book on trust. I'm just curious. When was your first encounter with, if I may call this as a value, I may call it as an emotion, I may call it as a principle. When was your first encounter to trust? That's a hard question to answer. I I, I just turned seventy one yesterday. So mm. I've been around here for a while. <laughs> Related happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Much of all of that is in the rear, quite a ways back in the rear view mirror. I think it has to, I mean, I, I didn't have a conscious conception of trust or trust as a distinction in some way. Mm. It Probably, is. Probably um, until I was, actually, I think, it was really when I was beginning to coach and I went through a coach training program. Um, and in that program, we were offered the dis um, some distinctions around trust rather than trust being like a big on off switch, which is how I think I'd held it up until that point. So having these distinctions suddenly allowed me to be more comfortable mm. with uh, with the idea of thinking about trust. And, you know, certainly I, I, I'm sure long before then I thought, I don't trust that person or I do trust that person or I don't think that trust that person trusts me or maybe they do trust me. But it was always this, either they trust me or they don't. I trust them or I don't. And so it was a, you know, it was a simple sort of thing. And therefore I didn't really think deeply about it. I just kind of went about doing what I did. And I, looking back, I'm pretty clear that some of those things that I did um, triggered distrust in other people. And some of those <laughs> things I did without thinking about it, um, built trust, <laughs> but it was all kind of done uh, without really any kind of conscious thought or any effort or um, any of that. And then when I heard that, or heard these distinctions that trust wasn't just this one big on off switch, then I actually begin to think about it. Um, of course, trust has, actually, you know what, come to think of it, back when I was an undergraduate hmm. in, um, at the University of California, Santa Cruz, I uh, somehow got roped into volunteering as a community mediator. I got trained to help mediate community disputes. People, you know, were having disputes of various kinds in the community. Hmm. And um, certainly trust was front and center there because I was helping two people or two, two parties build trust, enough trust between themselves to resolve their dispute and move on in their lives. Hmm. Um, so I did think about it then, but didn't really land until I heard these distinctions. And um, I heard the three distinctions I think you might be familiar with as well. Um, sincerity, reliability, and competence. Hmm. And began to play with those in my coaching because it was clear to me that trust seemed to be an issue with my clients. It had been an issue in many situations as I was working um, many years before that in, in companies trying to lead other people. But now I had some way to think about it differently. And uh, so I began to work with people. And as I did that, I also added a fourth distinction, which is care, hmm. which we can talk about in yeah. a moment if you'd like. Would love to. Um, but anyway, uh, so I had these, um, I started using these four distinctions and it allowed me, or rather I should say it allowed my clients to become much more intentional about building trust with other mm. people, about trusting wisely and also being trustworthy to other people. Mm. Um, it mm. took it out of the realm of sort of, oh, guesswork. If you... Yeah. You know, interestingly, when you're talking about being intentional or when you spoke about the different dimensions of trust, whether it's honesty, it's sincerity, it's reliability, and the fourth one that you spoke about, care. What I'm also listening is that trust is not 
unidirectional because you spoke about your intention to trust the other person and being trustworthy. So trusting yourself, trusting the person that you're talking to, trusting the environment that you are a part of, trusting life, trusting world. I think there could be several layers to trust. So that is one thing that I would definitely want to dig deeper into. But at the same time, I'm a firm believer that most of us have issues with trust. Most of us, if not all. That's the second component to that. The third component is I'm a firm believer. And this is based on all the friends who are authors as well. This is based on my conversations with those friends. They have written books on the area that they wanted to develop themselves in. As I'm sure you would have heard it, the best way to heal yourself is to help other people get healed. Now, let's take one step deeper into the third component. What has been your relationship with trust and why did you choose to write about trust? That's a good question. Um, and uh, my relationship with trust, I'd say, ha is much like my relationship with life in general. Mm. Um, in that I, um, throughout my 20s and 30s and even into my 40s, I kind of blundered around. I think like a little bit like what I said a moment ago. I blundered around doing what I did, being who I was, mm. um, and occasionally realizing that somebody didn't trust me or occasionally realizing that I'd done something that maybe was untrustworthy or very definitely was untrustworthy in some cases where I, you know, I, I was not honest with people either. Um, I was not factually honest, intellectually honest, or emotionally honest with people, mm. um, but really didn't know how to change that. Mm. Um, and so having, again, going back to these distinctions and this idea of being able to build and maintain and sometimes restore trust intentionally on purpose has been a, a really important aspect of my life. So my relationship with trust was um, unintentional, mm. uh, unconscious, um, but very much there. And I was aware of being at times untrustworthy to other people. And, and, and where did you learn this from? Um, other people's feedback, <laughs> other people's. Uh, um, so, for example, and I think I might have. Uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll tell a different story than I've told to some before. Hmm. One of the things that I'm not very good at is remembering specific data that cut that includes names, dates. Um, amounts of things, you know, those sorts of things. So at one point in my career, when I was working in a company, I was responsible for a, 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 some different product lines that were, you know, that my company um, developed, marketed, and sold. Um, I was responsible mm -hmm. for uh, marketing and sales specifically of those product lines. And uh, we would have meetings to talk about occasionally, not very often, once a quarter, more or less to talk about where we are with the, where were those things. And um, I recognize, I kind of knew that um, I was not very good at remembering the details, hmm. but when I would be asked, or was asked at one point by a new uh, vice president, um, some very detailed questions, and I didn't have the answers, hmm. uh, in s wanting to sound like I knew what I was talking about, wanting to sound competent in mm. my job, uh, instead of saying, oh, you know what, I don't have that information in my head, I'm going to have to go find it, or I don't have it in front of me, I'm going to have to go find it. Um, I made what I thought was a, a good guess. And um, I, I did that uh, more than once. And in fact, my guesses were pretty good because I've been keeping up on things. But it, they weren't good enough for this new vice president. And <laughs> um, he let me know that they weren't good enough, mm -hmm. um, that, that, that in effect, he didn't trust 
what I was telling him. Wow. And he did tell you. He did tell me that. Wow. Uh, so he told you specifically that, look, I don't trust you on the data that you're sharing with me. That's correct. And wow. I had to come clean and say, yeah, <laughs> you're right. I'm not being absolutely right on with the numbers. And he, he, he said that with the context that for him to do his job, he really needed to have the exact numbers of various things that I was supposed to be reporting to him on hmm. or reporting to the whole team, the management team on. Um, and so that was valuable in the sense that both he gave me the context, hmm. but it also told me, Hey, <laughs> you know, you're, you're not, you're not really, I was speaking as if I was giving him accurate data when in fact I wasn't, hmm. or hmm. it wasn't accurate enough for his, hmm. Hmm. Um, his needs. And so mm. he basically said, I don't trust it when you make guesses like that. And um, you're very close, but I want better. And so next time, either come prepared uh, or tell me that you actually no. He just said next time, come prepared, <laughs> which mm. I did. So what shifted for you in that moment when he said that I don't trust you with the data that you're sharing? Um. Well, first, of course, I kind of fell into embarrassment and, um, you know, oh my God, I really haven't been. I'm caught. Being, being, I'm caught. I haven't been being honest. So I was embarrassed and, uh, you know, felt a bit of guilt around not doing my job well, maybe even a little shame around that. Um, and the shame probably was what shifted things for me. It's okay, I, I got to clean this up. And so what shifted in me is recognizing that, yes, I, you know, I had been given the feedback a couple of years before mm. that I spoke with a, a sufficient authority that most people just took what I said on faith. Mm. In other words, they believed me um, because of how I said what I said. Mm. Um, and so here was evidence that that didn't work with everybody. Hmm. And also that that really wasn't good enough. And that's probably what shifted for me is that that wasn't good enough. Hmm. That I could continue to speak with authority, but actually um, at the same time, bring forward what really needed to be brought forward. Wow. So that one feedback shifted your game. Yeah. And also I'm just looking at if somebody comes to me and he you know, she tells me, Gaurav, what you're saying is uh, somehow I'm not able to trust. What I'm thinking is the kind of maturity that this person would have to share the feedback in a way that he does. Yes, yes, mm. which is, I think, critical in, and then something that doesn't happen very often, actually, in companies is that people that's, give and receive feedback that's really useful. That's radical candor, indeed. Yeah. Yes, it's uh, whatever you call it, however you call it, it takes trusting oneself and trusting that the, at, at least being able to create a space for the other person to hear. Yeah. And you know, what I'm also listening, Charles, that he did not trust one of your capabilities and somewhere he did trust that you would be able to absorb the feedback and work on that. Yes. And How does that is, work? Yeah. And this goes back to what I talked earlier about these different distinctions of trust, these assessment domains of trust. Hmm. So rather than if he had just had an on off switch himself, hmm. although I don't think he had the distinctions specifically, I think he was, he intuited that. And so I would now put it in the, in the, to the, the domain um, of care hmm. that, um, so he was saying that he did not trust what I said in the domain of sincerity. I was not, which is, covers honesty and integrity. Hmm. And hmm. he was saying to me, you know what, I, I don't trust that you're being completely honest with hmm. me here. You're not giving me what I really need, honestly. <laughs> I wasn't being factually honest with him. Mm -hmm. 
And he also was saying, I do believe you care about yourself, about the company, mm. about what we all need in order to work well together, that you can take this feedback and, um, and, and care about yourself mm. well enough that you can take this feedback and do something with it. So that means you can trust somebody on an area and yet don't trust the same person on another area. So I do trust you as a friend, but I don't trust your competence that you'll be able to go and represent me in that business meeting. Is a fair assumption to make. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah, that's certainly, um, yeah, <laughs> it's a good way of putting it. Uh, mm. I can trust you in these areas and distrust you in that area. Mm. And mm. Um, that allows us to, I, I think one of the things that allows us to do is have conversations, right? Mm. If, if all we have is trust or don't trust, and I don't trust something about how you are or how you do what you do, but all I'm able to do is say, I don't trust you. That's a very uncomfortable conversation to have with someone, especially mm. someone you don't necessarily know beyond the work setting. So you don't have a good sense of how that person really is and what, how they can listen and how, you know, how mature they are in a sense. Mm. Um, that becomes a very uncomfortable conversation, but if I can say, you know what, uh, you know, like this guy in effect said, is I, I I'm going to give him the distinctions now as if he, as if he had them then, mm. you know, he, he, so he would have been able to say, Charles, I don't, I don't believe that you are giving me accurate data. That is, I don't believe that you're being sincere with us, the team, me in particular, um, when I asked you those questions about data. And yet I do believe that I can trust that you are um, basically sincere um, and also that you are, you care, you care about mm. what's happening here in yeah. the company and that you're competent, you, you do your job um, well and you know, the other area, which is reliability that you keep specific commitments or promises that you make. See, I can trust all of those things. I just can't trust you here in this one area. What and, a beautiful distinction. Well, the value of that is that we can have conversations much more effectively that way. The mm. moment for most of us that someone says, I don't trust you, what happens? Mm. You the, just the snap out of that. Go, the yeah. defenses go up. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. become, I know for me, I, I start to get really defensive. Well, I used to. Now I get curious, but... Uh, you know, even maybe 10 years ago, my first response, or well, maybe 20 years ago, my first response would have been defensiveness. Mm. Actually, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about this, but once I learned these distinctions, it also allowed me, rather than to become defensive about someone saying they don't trust me, I could become curious because I had mm. some tools, some distinctions with which to become curious. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I, I hadn't actually thought about that, but that's wonderful. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Chance, no, this is really interesting because what I'm listening right now is I've personally come across teams, I've personally come across couples where somehow they are not been able to have conversations as well. In those kind of cases where they have crossed the bridge where they are not comfortable looking eye to eye or have conversations. What could be a possible way to rebuild trust? Just curious. Yeah. So that's a really important question for all of us because we've all damaged trust with each other at times yeah. and in, in situations. Consciously or unconsciously, um, knowingly, unknowingly. Yeah, yeah, mostly unconsciously, actually. Yeah, uh, I I maintain that especially in the workplace, probably ninety to ninety five percent of um, things that happen that somebody then says, "Oh, I don't trust that person." Mm. That person was not being um, consciously untrustworthy. 
Mm. They didn't understand the implications until maybe later um, of what they were doing. Just like me, I didn't understand, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, fortunately, I had good feedback. If I hadn't had the gut feedback, I would have kept on doing that, um, thinking I was it was it was working for people. Yeah. Um, yes. So we 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 do that, and we damage trust with each other. So well, in the in the thin book of trust, as you as you know, because I think you've read it, um, I have um, in the, the second edition, which just came out. Yeah. I have seven steps to prepare oneself for having a conversation with someone else. Hmm. So if I think that you've done something that um, has created a distrust in of you in me, hmm. and I value the relationship for whatever reason enough that I want to rebuild it, that I want to address this. Um, so I have these seven steps that you can go through or that I can go through to prepare myself, I, you know, to have a conversation with you. Mm. Um, and that conversation is the beginning usually of a series of conversations, mm. but mm. I've seen it work many, many times. And it's, it's very powerful when it does, because one of the things that happens when trust is damaged or broken, but then rebuilt or restored or repaired is it actually comes back stronger. Um, so it's like, you know, you break a bone and it heals and that part of the bone where the break was, um, is actually stronger than the rest of the bone around it. Hmm. Um, so how do you do that? Well, as I said, I have these, these seven steps for a person to think through, how am I going to have this conversation? Hmm. I, I want to have this conversation. I need to have a, this conversation. And then how am I going to invite that other person into this conversation and begin it in such a way hmm. that they can hear me, they can hear my concerns, and then be able to um, respond, you know, and we can actually start having a conversation to hmm. rebuild the trust between us. Hmm. Um, so that's really critical, is to be able to have conversations with each other. And if we have distinctions around trust, it makes it a whole heck of a lot easier to have those conversations, as I said a little earlier. Yeah. Much easier to say, you know what, um, I, I want to talk to you about competence. I need to be clear about our standards around competence here and the, that I'm seeing that you are not meeting my standards of competence. Um, and so I'm having some difficulty around that. Let's talk about standards and what we mean and what's what's appropriate there. Much easier conversation than I don't trust you. So what are those steps, Charles? Well, here are the steps, seven things to do before the conversation. Mm. First one is decide if you're willing to talk to the other, to the other person about it. Mm. And I have some questions you can ask yourself, but it's really the first step is, am I even willing to do this? Is yeah. there enough value here in this, this relationship, because trust is something that's in our relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. It's not separate from. And so either our relationship has trust in it or it has distrust in it. Yeah. If it has distrust in it, how can I shift that, and bring it back to a place of trust? Mm -hmm. So the first, first thing I have to decide is, do I want to do that? Then I find it's really useful to identify which of the assessment domains is my distrust showing up for me what are my assessments about this other person mm. so that i can begin to think about what the then what the behaviors are mm -hmm. the specific actions that's the second thing the third one is to define standards that mm. i have for trustworthiness got it so what's the assessment domain what are my standards within that ses assessment domain related to trust mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'll just do a simple one in terms of um reliability which is one of the four assessment domains yeah do you keep your specific commitments mm. how well how often um is my standard that you you uh don't actually um arrive on time to our uh appointments uh once out of every five times and you're at that standard it's not an issue but if my standard is you never ever arrive late 
hmm. then I've got to take a look at that and see how realistic that is for one thing. Uh, but on the other thing, I have to. It's going to help me in a conversation with that other mm. person. Mm -hmm. So understanding what my standard is, identifying the specific actions or behaviors that have led to the assessment I have of distrust, which okay. is where that uh, assessment domain comes in. Yeah. If I'm again, you know, thinking about uh, the domain of care. What are the things that you do that's telling me you really don't care about me? Mm -hmm. or us or our team or what we're doing trying to do together so that I can talk about that rather than you as a person. Hmm. Big difference. Talking about you as a person as untrustworthy versus talking about the things that you are doing that creates an assessment of distrust in you. Absolutely. Me. That's a huge distinction. A person is not his behavior. Yeah. Hmm. Then the fifth step is to ask myself, what am I doing mm. that may be contributing to the situation? Got it. Which is a really important step because it's so easy to say, you know, point the finger and go, you, you, you. Mm. Mm. But almost always there's something I'm doing here that needs to be looked at. Yeah. And if I'm going to have an honest conversation with somebody about my distrust of them, I better have taken a look at myself. Makes sense. Yeah. The sixth one is determine what I need from the other person mm. in order to be able to rebuild trust mm. and be mm. able to put that in the form of a request to them. Um, and then the six, seventh step is really to you know, begin by asking the other person if they're willing to have a conversation Beautiful. Uh, about something that concerns me. In the book, I give examples for each of the different domains of trust. So, so that's, uh, a complete, to... that's a complete cycle, right? It begins with, am I willing to have a conversation? And then I look at the assessments, then I look at the standards of those assessments and what's the specific action that the person is doing or not doing that's causing that. And that's where I start to look deep within myself. How yeah. am I contributing to this? And yeah. what do I need from the other person? And then look at the willingness from yeah. the other person's side. You know, also, Charles, you mentioned that you can only trust the other person when you're willing to trust yourself. Let's look at the spin this. How would you create a distinction that I'm not willing or I'm not able to trust you because of any specific action that you have done or not done? Or because it's my inability to trust myself. How do you ensure that it's not my own projection onto you? And then I'm calling that this person is not trustworthy. Well, yeah, now we get into the, the whole area of shadow work, don't we? Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, taking a look at what I'm projecting onto the other person. Precisely. Um, th that, one's <laughs> that one's a lot deeper step. Um, and I think actually we don't need to go there necessarily in order to have um, effective conversations with other people. Mm. That's really for a deeper learning in myself. Mm. Um, so I, I, on the one hand, I don't want to tell people, leave people with the idea that they really have to do a lot of deep personal work in order to have a conversation with somebody about, about trust, mm. about building it or rebuilding it. Um, and at the same time, uh, I think, let's just take an example. I, how am I contributing? Basically, you're you know, kind of asking, how am I contributing to this situation? Mm. So um, let's take an example of reliability, mm. all right? which is keeping specific commitments. So let's say I, I need to talk to somebody about the fact that I, I, I don't trust them anymore because they've so often not um, actually kept commitments that they've made to me. Mm. Um, and this has been going on now for, let's say, months and months, mm. right? So how might I be contributing to that or have contributed to that? Well, right off the bat, I have to look and say, oh my God, I've been letting this person get away with that for mm. months and months. I have not held that other person accountable for all this time. Mm. So that's certainly something that I have to own up to. That back the, around the second or maybe third time that they missed or didn't fulfill that commitment that they had made, um, 
it would have been much more useful at that point for me to say something, but I didn't. I've been letting it go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So what is it? I mean, then I can go really take a deeper look at what is it in me that prevented me from or, you know, held me back from saying that way back then. There's some work, personal work that I can do. But in terms of the conversation that I need to have, I at the very least need to own up to that, that I haven't been holding that person accountable Beautiful. for all this time. So obviously they have thought that that's okay for them to do what they were doing. Beautiful. Beautiful. So what I'm listening is that how am I contributing? Now, if I'm not being able to trust the other person, is it because I have issues with trusting myself, the world, life, the others? Or is it because of what the other person is doing or not doing? What I'm also listening is my ability or inability to hold the other person accountable or set psychological and emotional boundaries so that I can protect myself. And all of the above. <laughs> and all of the above, really? absolutely, yeah. <laughs> it, because those are all pieces of it. And so I think one of the things that's important in this whole, in our conversation and, and in conversations that people have with each other, particularly in the workspace, um, is, uh, so, yeah, if I'm coaching someone, we're going to look at some of those deeper questions because that's where that person has got room to grow. If it's just a matter of, you know, okay, let's, I need to work something out. You and I are peers, or what, let's say you and I are peers in an organization, and um, I have not set appropriate boundaries and not held you accountable um, for stuff that's pissing me off. <laughs> um, in order to have that conversation with you and begin to restore some trust, I need to just own that piece of it and be able to say that to you. Um, so again, you know, if I'm coaching someone, I'm going to, you know, help them look deeper and deeper underneath that and what's going on. What are the deeper patterns for that person, the deeper habitual behaviors that made it difficult or impossible for them to even see that they needed to set boundaries, let alone uh, do it. Um, but for the conversation itself, they just need to be able to own certain pieces of that and say, okay, this is partly my fault. I see that. And I want to acknowledge that. And it's easy said than done. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, it sometimes is for sure. It often is. Partly because we don't, um, we armor ourselves against anything that might damage our own um, self-image. Mm. We put on armor that keeps us feeling safe from attack from without, attack of our self-image in many ways or what. So I, I, and actually this might be a great place to go back to what for me is the beginning in many ways, mm. which is how I define trust. Mm. Trust is making something you value vulnerable to another person's actions. <laughs> wow. Say it again. Trust is making wow. something you value mm. vulnerable to another person's actions. And you do so, we do that because for one, we believe that the other person will um, care about, take care of, not harm mm. what it is that we value. We also do so because that's trust. I mean, that's building trust. That's the starting point. Me trusting you, me making what I care about valuable, what I care about vulnerable to your actions allows us to work together, allows us to do something that neither one of us could do by ourselves. And so part of understanding trust from my from my perspective me trusting you um so let's just be let, let's just make it real here so i'm trusting that we're having this conversation and um that you know you'll have this recording you'll put it out there and um i'll be really crass about it and say okay i'm trusting that you're going to take what I'm saying and not harm, damage it. You're not going to be saying things outside of our conversation, for example, that 
God, that that Charles guy was an ass. You know, he was an idiot in our comment. What a what a foolish thing to say, or whatever, right? You're going to um, even if you might have <laughs> some assessments about me or along those lines, you're not going to air them publicly. Um, okay, so I'm so I am uh, something I value is my reputation, right? Mm. I mean, I. I have complete trust that you're not going to do, that you're not going to do that. So I, that's why I'm having this conversation with you, right? Mm. Um, so I am making this vulnerable to you, myself, my some of the things that I said to you about my own untrustworthiness at times in my life, um, because I trust that you are going to take care, if you will, of. Mm. what I've said to you and and in that sense an extension um my own concerns about you know how I show up in the world which are getting wow. I, I'm, and I, I have to admit I'm less and less concerned about that shit at 71 but yeah yeah no but, but anyway but, but I'm getting your point because what I'm listening is that in teams you will find conflicts because somewhere or the other the team members believe that it's a safe place to have a conflict. It's not that if I say something, you say something, we are not going to walk out of the relationship. We are not going to walk out of a team. So the very fact that we are having conflicts in the team, that itself is a sign that there is some kind of a trust. Is this a okay parallel to draw from this conversation? Absolutely. That, in fact, uh, I just uh, have been working with a team and uh, apparently there, there have been a couple of situations in their recent past hmm. when um, one team member said something to another and it was taken the wrong way by a third team member and um, well, actually the team leader who kind of uh, jumped all over the person who had made the comments and that person then withdrew, did not trust that he could he um, could say what he really believed in this situation. He could not speak up. And so that that's a bad downward spiral for a team because if people, and other people are also taking a similar lesson, if you will, from those couple incidents. Hmm. So um, yeah, being trust, you, you, we've all, I think by, by this time heard the term, um, uh psychological safety yeah it's it's become a really big uh, uh issue or concern an idea that's you know, how do we create psychological safety uh and psychological safety uh, is is actually underpinned by trust um, and in particular trust in the domain of care which is the assessment that you have um my best interests, my, you, you mean good for me, you intend good for me. You might make mistakes and do things that um, actually harm my best interests, but it's not intentional and we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. So you have, because ultimately you do have my best interests and my good in mind. Um, and so that one, plus the other three as well, to some degree, all kind of underpin um, the feeling of psychological safety in a, in a team wow. that, yeah, I can speak up. Yeah. I can um, say what I want to say, what I need to say. Um, I can challenge other people without damaging the relationships that I have with them. This is so interesting because the words which are coming to me right now as I'm just listening to you is forgiveness. The words which are coming to me is, as I've just heard you saying, care. The word which is coming to me is compassion, kindness. And unless we bring these emotions like resentment and resignation and jealousy, they're going to chew away and throw the relationship in a bin. Yeah. Um, and again, I think, um, actually, can I read you something? I think I have right here. This is from an author, writer named Barry Lopez. Um, it was actually... He, he uh, said this in an interview in a magazine called The Sun, uh, the December 2019 issue. Lack of intimacy 
seems to cover a lot of the trouble we're in. You can't gain intimacy without vulnerability, and you can't have vulnerability without trust. Part of our, and so that vulnerability and that intimacy are part of psychological safety. Mm. Okay. Part of our difficulty is that we have trouble trusting people. So we rarely get to the place where we can open up and become vulnerable. And until we get to that place, there is no intimacy for us, no emotional mm. connection where we feel truly welcome and in which we are able to participate fully which is exactly what really we're talking what what we want in a team what we on a team um, with our friends with our families um so again getting back to that idea of presence and participating participating fully in our lives and i think one of the things that i, I want to say about that is that the capacity to build trust to maintain it, to repair it when it gets damaged. These are all part, a set of a competency, really. Building trust is a competency. Um, it doesn't, we don't come just wired either to be trustworthy or not, to, to trust other people wisely or not. Um, it's a competency that can be learned, it can be improved, it can be practiced on a regular basis. And when we do, then um, we are more able to allow ourselves to be vulnerable and to connect more deeply with other people, more intimately with other people. And that's part of what psychological safety is on a team, is that sense of, oh, yeah, um, you know, we can, we can have uh, knock down, drag out arguments and we won't damage the relationship because we are really, we really care about each other. We are, we are intimate in a way enough so that we can weather this. And wow. um, so the, the wow. idea that, and the um, distinctions, this framework that I use is one of the tools, is a tool that, um, that really helps develop that competency of trust building. Mm. We can mm. use it to be better trust builders, both between me and you, but also for yourself, for example, you can use it as a, as a, a tool and a support for, um, for example, helping other people around you become more trustworthy. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Charles. I think the way you have been able to bring everything together, whether it's vulnerability or it's connection or intimacy and how trust plays such a vital role. So whether you are a homemaker or you are a manager, you are a team leader or a CEO of an organization, it depends entirely on your ability, as you use the word capacity, to build trust, to rebuild trust, to regain trust, to learn from trust and to ensure that we create a culture of trust by building vulnerability and connection. Thank you so much, Charles. I think it was uh, profound in two sense listening to you. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. You ask wonderful questions. And um, so this is, I exper have experienced this as a real conversation as opposed to me just talking about stuff. So thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Pleasure. Thank you so much. And as I told you, uh, whether it was my first conversation in the year 2014 or all the conversations in between, or for that matter, this conversation, I'm always smitten by the insights, distinctions that you create. So thank you so much for who you are and walking on this path of spreading the message of trust, being an evangelist in the space of trust in the world. Thank you. You're welcome.